Recording started. The chair notes the time is 6.05. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As EBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with the roll call of ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows. Present. Mr. John Gilbert. Mr. Everald Henry. Present. Mr. Philip White. Present. Uh, Ms. And alternates, Ms. Sarah Marshall. Here. Ms. Hilda Greenbaum. Here. And Mr. David Slobeter, who's not here. So we have uh, we have a quorum present. Also attending the meeting tonight with will be Mr. Rob Mora, the building commissioner, and Mr. Rob Wachilla, planner for the town. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by chapter two of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties and interest. All hearings and, member and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZBA webpage. Tonight's public meeting is an administrative meeting, the purpose of which is to discuss various zoning issues and the zoning bylaw in general that are of interest to the members. I also was to provide ZBA members, both full members and associate members, with the opportunity to discuss and raise questions about any topic related to the ZBA. We will also consider approval of minutes from the September 14th ZBA meeting. So tonight's agenda is the minutes, uh, consideration of the meeting minutes from September 14th, 2023, a public meeting on a discussion, zoning discussions on various topics presented before the ZBA in previous meetings, and the zoning bylaw in general. General public comment period, where the public may comment on any matter not before the board tonight, and adjournment. There's also other, excuse me, but there's other business which we will discuss the upcoming schedule and hearings, including the schedule for the 40B um, application and then adjournment. So the first order of business tonight is the minutes of uh, consideration to approve the minutes of September 14th. I've read them. I think they are complete. Does anybody else, um, does anybody have any changes to those minutes? All right. If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from September 14th. Is there a second? Second. All right. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Mr. White, I see seconded as well. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Everett, Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. That's four votes of the, of the full members. Motion is approved. Next order of business is the general discussion on uh, issues, zoning issues that we've had before us about which we had a lot of interest. And I know Mr. Mora uh, has put some time into both the um, section 3.01 um, uh, two uses on one on one lot and other things that we've come up with uh, that have come before us in the past um, few months. And I think we want to talk about that. And I understand there are also other questions generally from the members. And this is a great opportunity for any of you or all of us to raise questions. Uh, if you have questions about the zoning bylaw in general or the process of the ZBA, please feel free to raise them. But let's move first to, to Mr. Mora and talk about uh, some of the issues that you've been looking through, Rob, and you know, where you've, what you've been uh, considering over the last couple of weeks. Thank you, Ms. Judge. Uh, yeah, I, I only have uh, section 3.1 on my list to talk about tonight, but definitely happy to yep. talk about anything else that anyone else would like to bring up. 
And this, uh, some of you will remember a case uh, that was submitted a couple of months ago and, um, you know, recently ended in a withdrawal where the applicant was proposing to uh, construct a second duplex on a property that already had a duplex. So the issue there was two duplex buildings on a single property. And this discussion is about a larger variety of combinations of uh, uses, uh, but mainly having to do with the one and two families. Uh, so it could be one two family and one single family. It could be two single families, two duplexes, uh, and then either a single family or a duplex along with say an apartment building or a townhouse. So any of those types of combinations are kind of part of the issue here. And, you know, um, if it's helpful, Rob can bring up the language, but I'm just going to read section 3.01. It's a, it's a pretty short section, uh, but causes a lot of question and confusion. Uh, and it's the development or operation on a single lot of more than one dwelling or more than one principal use described in section 3.3. So 3.3 is the table of uses, all of the various types of uses. And that is expressly prohibited except where the principal uses are clearly complementary to each other or otherwise provided by this bylaw. So right there, you know, clearly complementary. Nobody knows what that means. Uh, there, there's very little guidance on that. And you know, if that's in front of the board someday again, or in front of the board at all, uh, we'll we'll have to work through that. Uh, there are some very clear kind of cleaner examples of what that would mean. Um, it, you know, examples we have in town, a car wash and a gas station. You know, the board might find that's cl clearly complementary. Uh, you know, a, a daycare and a auto body shop might not be. You know, so again, there's there's really no guidance on that. And what has come up recently, including that case uh, with the two duplexes, is can, can we permit more than one of the residential type uses where there's dwellings involved um, where the bylaw doesn't expressly say that you can. And, and that's, you know, that was the two duplex question. That's always been the two single family question on a lot. And I've, you know, I've consistently not allowed two single families on a lot. And, uh, the board has in a couple of cases allowed a, two duplexes or two du a duplex and a single family. Uh, that are, are one of those types of combinations. But as we look through this, um, the issue that we have with this language is that we have to give give meaning to this, this part of the section that says not more than one dwelling. Uh, and the way that I'm interpreting this is that any residential, any of our residential uses would be subject to that restriction of not more than one dwelling, unless the bylaw in section 3.3 says otherwise. And, and if you, you work through that in examples that I've talked about with the, the single family of the duplex or the townhouse and apartments, what you find is that when we're dealing with one family and two family, the bylaw doesn't, doesn't say anywhere else that it's allowed to combine those uses or have multiple buildings on a lot. It isn't expressly permitted anywhere else. Uh, where it does say that you can do that is with townhouses and apartments. So we have, you know, we have a purpose for this language when we apply it to townhouses and apartments uh, to allow the use. And then, uh, you know, uh, when we are dealing with one families and two families, we are finding that it's not permitted. So. Um, the, the interpretation going forward is going to be that single family dwellings cannot be combined with other dwellings, other single family dwellings or other duplexes uh, or other um, any other residential use um, because our bylaw doesn't allow it. And, and we'll, you know, we'll recommend that the planning department take that under advisement and decide if there's, you know, any need to change the bylaw or clarify anything. Uh, but what we will continue to uh, allow for applications to come forward is uh, apartments and townhouses when there's more than one building. 
And again, that's because those sections clearly uh, clearly offer that opportunity, both in the criteria of section 3.3 and the definitions. Uh, so that's kind of a general overview of that section. Uh, but, uh, happy to hear any questions or clarify anything. Mr. Mora, um, does it make a difference if it's dwelling or dwelling unit? Is that at all, is, is, would that be more specific or would that change the interpretation of 3.01 if it said dwelling unit? So we, we don't define dwelling in, in the bylaw. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, was you know, that really yeah. that, right. So it does add, add to that confusion. Um, I think if it, if it said dwelling unit, it might actually be a little clearer to us what that meant, uh, you know, and what uses that would apply to. Um, but I think the result would be the same, uh, you know, where if you're, you're thinking through, well, what would make, you know, make, make a difference here? Um, you know, it would be adding the clause, except, except where allowed by special permit you know, something like that at the end of it or, or at the right point within this language. Um, I think it probably, you know, we probably work on the language a little bit more comprehensive than that, but, you know, that's the kind of thing we would need to see because the bylaw doesn't allow it in other places. So we need to have some mechanism to permit it. We would have to say by special permit, or we'd have to go to section 3.3 in the single family and duplex sections and uh, again, either uh, authorize something by a special permit or um, permit criteria where more than one building could be on a parcel. One thing that I, no, I was impressed with earlier today when I was reading through the zoning bylaw is that this is the 3.01 is the, like the first statement of restriction of use. Uh, everything else is de kind of definitions that come up. It's almost, it's, it's like a, I don't know if that's by accident or if that was intended to say that this is a fundamental principle that we're only gonna allow one dwelling um, unless otherwise provided by bylaw or you know, the significance of being the very first statement after, uh, you know, after we go through articles one and two, which are kind of definitional. Um, so I'm, is, is that important? Was that a consideration given when it was adopted? Do you remember? Or is this well, just a fluke? I, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't remember when it was adopted. I, what I yeah. would say is that probably not so much because it's a very standard format of a bylaw to come into the use regulations and start with what's prohibited and then go into what's permitted. Uh, so it's probably okay. following a model bylaw that, you know, that just puts prohibited uses first in the section. Um, but, I, but I do think it was deliberate to uh, to, um, you know, prevent more than one single family dwelling on a lot. I'm not sure if it was thought out any further than that, uh, at, at right. the time. I don't think there's any, any information that suggests it was or was not, you know, that I, that I have been able to come across. <clears throat> and I have one last question and I'll open it up. Um, can you help us with the death of the contrast accessory use versus complementary because uh, you know that I know it's defined and there's by example um, later on in the in the zoning bylaw but sometimes that they get confusing what an accessory use is as opposed to a complementary use and so can you kind of walk us through the differences there yeah so when when we're looking at this section and um, when you're um, you know proposed a project where you have to determine if they're complementary, you're looking at two principal uses. Uh, so um, they're, they're both the primary, a primary use of the property. The accessory uses uh, are there in combination with a principal use. So you can't have an accessory use unless you have the principal use. And in, in section five, in article five, uh, we talk about a few very specific types of accessory uses, uh, home occupation or ADUs. Uh, but then there's, you know, kind of this, this clause in that section that says, or, you know, any accessory use that's customarily found in Hampshire County. 
you know, so that that could leave things pretty open, uh, you know, and, and we've dealt with uh, dog kennels and, uh, you know, breweries and Big craft care. wineries and I mean, all kinds, all kinds of things. Right. So, you know, that's that's another section of the bylaw that that gives opportunity. But then, you know, it's tricky because it's not really clear on how far you can go with it. So uh, when we're talking about complementary uses, we're not looking at principal versus accessory use. We're looking about at the kind of the compatibility of the two principal uses to function yeah. on the site. Um, and that's that's a hard one. That's a hard one. That's why I was trying to give you kind of the, the clearest examples there are, uh, which are rarely the ones we get. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. Mr. Everett, uh, Mr. Henry? I think... Um, Couple of people had their hands up before me. Oh, they did. All right, yes. who was who beat you up? I, no, Mr. I think Mr. Meadows, perhaps. Mr. Meadows, I think Mr. Meadows did. Uh, All right. Who was before me? Uh, and he'll okay. I'm, we'll go back. So, Miss Green. All right. I won't bother giving you a history lesson. I could, but I'm not going to. <laughs> um, but I did want to ask. We have been changing this bylaw so many times over the past many years, many decades as UMass grows. And especially to say the last 20 years of town meeting, lots of changes happened. But when these changes happened to upgrade to changes in state law, we didn't always get back, go back and get all of the tales that were left behind as such that we've been talking about revising the bylaw, getting a new kind of form-based code goes back a few years, uh, or a hybrid code like Northampton. And so I know Rob started went before COVID, revising the bylaw to get rid of the things that are incompatible with each other. And I'm before I'm just sort of curious. Um, where do we stand in that process? Is this just going to be so a band-aid patch or, or are we really thinking of going ahead and finding the places where our sororities and fraternities the same thing, same use? And my second question is, when you look at the table of uses, especially under the resident, are they considered different principal uses? Or is it a category you look at as residential? What, what are we talking about? Okay, good questions, good questions. So um, it, it, first, I just want to be clear that all I'm talking about tonight is the interpretation of the bylaw, how I will apply it day to day and advise applicants, um, you know, who may or may not be considering applying for a permit. Um, I'm not talking about changing the bylaw. Uh, that's not something that has been discussed with the planning department yet. Uh, and, you know, there's a long list of priorities that um, exist for bylaw improvements. So um, I have no idea any time frame when that may happen. Um, you, one question you had about work on revising the bylaw. Uh, it's true. It's something that uh, I had took. Uh, this was before COVID. I, I had taken the idea with Christine Brestrop to... Uh, the planning board to try to get support to have staff really go through um, as a uh, to recodify the bylaw and and make corrections and you know a few may, that might be seen as substantive changes but um, there wasn't a whole lot of support for that there wasn't a whole lot of interest in that and um, then that that idea kind of got put aside and hasn't hasn't gone through uh, or gone any further so that's not that's not in process. Um, and, and definitely something that needs to be revisited again. Uh, so then we're back to kind of looking at section by section and you see what the CRC is doing or has done this year or counselors and what the planning department is currently working on with the planning board. Uh, and that's about it. So, um, you know, that's where we stand with the bylaw. And, and this is really just how we're going to apply this language that we have that we wish could be a little bit different or some of us might wish it could be a little bit different. Um, it, 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 to result in the opportunity to have some additional housing uh, density built uh, in the residential districts. Um, and, and, you know, but we just have to apply the language we have at this time. Your other question is a good one because that comes up quite often. You know, what is the difference between 
duplex or what is the difference between owner occupied duplex and non owner occupied duplex. They all have their separate uh, categories, uh, uh, classifications and, and identifications in the, in the bylaw. And um, just like in other sections, non-residential sections, um, I always apply each one as its own principal use. So you can in fact have a non-owner occupied duplex and an owner occupied duplex and be dealing with two separate different principal uses. Uh, just because they all kind of get grouped under that uh, residential uh, category um, doesn't mean they're all the same classification. So that means you would put a unit, uh, if it was big enough for four units, but apartments weren't allowed, you could put one owner occupied and one non-owner occupied duplex on the same parcel. And this would be a decision that a, sort of a policy of the ZBA that allows you to do rather than have to be rubber stamped by a, another board like the CRC, for example. No, I, I'm suggesting that you can't do that. And because what you just picked were two duplex categories that neither one of them expressly permit uh, constructing two buildings on a parcel. So the, the interpretation is going to be that, no, you can't do that, even though they're two different principal uses and you may or may not find them to be complementary to each other. The fact is that it's more than one dwelling and we don't authorize more than one dwelling anywhere else for that use class or those two use classifications. So we're going to say no in that case, uh, so unless the Bible changes. So 798, 200, you knew was illegal when, well, I don't want to say what you knew, but I mean, it, from what you're saying now, really shouldn't have been pushed forward to apply for a special permit, or they're allowed to do whatever they want, whether it's legal or not. Well, I can't stop an application from being submitted, um, okay. but certainly I'll, to be as clear as like that case caused us to look at this language really closely. And I was asked to come up with an opinion on how we're going to apply this language. So, you know, there was a lot of public uh, response to that proposal and a lot of good thinking to go along with um, the bylaw. And it made us have to look at it and made me have to decide what am I going to do with this tomorrow when an application comes in. So, you know, that one, um, I think we all, it, it worked out for everyone because they withdrew and now they're reconsidering what they can do with that property, if anything else. But I would not, um, I would not suggest to an applicant that they submit that application in the future. Like I said, I can't legally stop them. I can not sign the application, which doesn't look good when it finally gets to the board, but they can, they, I can't prevent them from filing an application with the town clerk under state law. And ultimately the board has to open the, open the hearing and, and take some kind of action, even if it's a recommendation that we're giving the board to, to not move forward, they have to do something with it. Now that usually doesn't happen. Uh, you know, if I, if I tell an applicant that, that this isn't really a good uh, proposal, uh, they're likely to listen. Uh, you know, but I think if there was a case where somebody wanted to challenge language of the bylaw, they could. One last one, and then I won't be a pig. Um, the first house, it looks clearly like from two centuries, at least that's what they say, that there's an 18th century part and a 19th century part. Why could that not be submitted as a converted dwelling? And does it matter? It, it, no, it, it could be. It could be. Um, so uh, the converted dwelling does only only allows a very uh, small amount of new construction. Oh, okay. So, so That's you know, okay. if they have if there's if the lot area exists on an existing two family and uh, whether there's a little addition, but mostly reworking the existing building, there could be a result in an additional dwelling unit under the converted dwelling section. Uh, and we allow up to four in, in the, in the um, yep. RN district. Uh, so that, that could be a possibility, um, but what, we've been through that a lot. And you probably remember um, it wasn't until, I don't know, 
10, 12 years ago that the bylaw even allowed an addition to a converted dwelling. It used to not allow any addition. Oh and then we went ahead and put in this very small, modest, uh, uh, it's a percentage of the overall uh, footprint and gross floor area uh, calculation that results in a small uh, addition. We have been through the exercise with applicants before. Um, you saw it recently with um, 65 Taylor Street. Uh, yeah. use the converted dwelling section with an addition uh, being proposed, uh, but it was a very small increase that was being proposed in that building, it was mostly reusing the existing building, which is what it was intended to do. Thank you. Mr. Meadows, I think you are next on, I next up. So. In, a, in a similar vein, if the ZBA has granted a special permit, is it um, is it reasonable for someone else to come in and ask for an additional special permit on the same property? It, I mean, it doesn't seem to me that it would be, but, um, and if so, then should we be taking more uh, caution in granting special permits where there's the possibility of an additional special permit being requested for the same property. Mr. Moore, before you answer, Mr. Meadows, can you give an example? Well, a, a, a very simple example is what we just had on North Pleasant Street. Um, but I, I, I believe that there are others that we have, we've had come through where there was a special permit to begin with and then there was another special permit requested for the same property. So Craig, are you referring to a special, a historic press special permit that occurred years ago or a special permit that's contemporaneous withdrawn and then a new special permit coming up? Yeah, either way. Either way. I, 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 can, I can probably work through an example here. Um, so there, there isn't anything in our bylaw or in 40A that prevents kind of that, that multiple kind of special permit attempts uh, or even or even uh, issuance. So, um, and it's not, it's not an unusual strategy for somebody, um, whether it's um, to kind of, you know, work towards fully developing a property or um, for financial reasons, uh, you know, we could have a single family, a large single family house that uh, applies under the converted dwelling section to be turned into two units within the existing footprint by special permit. And that could be authorized. And then five years later, um, you know, the same property might have an outbuilding, uh, you know, a barn that they want to convert into a dwelling unit. And now that's the third unit under the converted dwelling section that needs another special permit. We often try to um, modify or replace the original special permit just to keep it cleaner. Uh, years past, 20, 30 years ago, there was a lot of multiple special permits on properties. I think in recent years, we tend to try to, to, to try to keep that cleaner and, and replace one with the next one, even though it's authorizing more to happen. But I think that's expected. I think the bylaw does allow that to happen. Um, and it certainly would probably be more likely in non-residential uses that are authorized by special permits, say restaurants. You know, you've got a uh, a commercial property where three restaurants or bars are located, each of those require special permits. So it's one after another on that property. Yeah, I, I, it, it's easy to see how <laughs> multiple restaurants or similar would be working in that vein. I'm a little bit leery of housing the way that the, the requests have been recently. Are you thinking that they're kind of taking a step to achieve something that they would not otherwise be able to achieve? Is that what you're concerned about, Craig? So that you're that if yeah. you get step A, you, you couldn't go to where they eventually want to be right away. But if you take the first step, take a second step, and then a third step, you eventually achieve what you couldn't achieve in a single application. Is that what you're talking about? Exactly. Yeah, so that, that yeah, I know that's a that's a little bit different, um, and and I know the board has one or two cases coming up where, you know, the uh, the original special permit 
you know, restricted something. Let's mm -hmm. just say the number of bedrooms, perhaps, and that's not not one coming forward. But um, if there was a limit on the number of bedrooms and then the applicants back and say, you know what, I, I really need that fourth bedroom in this, this dwelling unit or both of these dwelling units, let's have that condition removed by special permit. Um, yeah, that's, that's something that um, the board faces, uh, has always faced that. Um, I think I remember a lot of parking related issues uh, where uh, prior boards were, you know, the attempt to restrict parking, hoping that maybe that would reduce occupancy or limit the use of the property, um, you know, ended up creating problems with pro parking that, you know, later boards tried to correct by adding parking on the site. Um, so I think, you know, the board has to carefully review that and the original proposal, you know, whatever we're looking at these, the first thing Rob and I do is we go back to the original special permit and try to understand what was probably Hilda thinking at the time when they made that decision. And we mm -hmm. try to really understand why was this prohibited or why was this limit put in place? And, you know, we use that when we talk with the applicants about, you know, do they really want to, you know, pursue this and understand the challenge that might come up when the board realizes that there was good reason, there was good reason for this condition. But then there might be cases where the condition clearly didn't work you know, or doesn't really have any effect or good purpose and should be removed. And, you know, we get both of those and you get a lot of, um, you know, expiration on change of ownership and, you know, different things that are conditions of permits that the newer owners are looking to remove. Well, that brings up exactly what I'm saying. Should we be more cautious and more thorough in the minutes and, and in what, in our rationale for, um, for granting special permits so that I, when you look back at it, you can, you've got a better idea what, what the rationale was. I, I think so. I, I definitely think that's important. I think it's important first for the board to take the time to carefully review why the condition is, why, why it's, you know, they may off, you know, the, the reflex may be that they, you don't agree with it because it's not the way you, you, you know, you condition a permit now that you see that similar, but understanding why and taking that time to see why the board 20 years ago put that condition on, I think is really important. Very good, thank you. Um, Mr. Henry and then Ms. Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Mr. Moore, if, if I understood you correctly, um, did you say that um, moving forward, um, and I'm going to use the example of North Pleasant Street. Um, you would advise the applicant that that petition is not allowed under 3.01. I, I would advise the applicant that there isn't is not a permitting path to 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 construct the second duplex on a property with a single duplex. And I would advise them that I would that would be my recommendation to the board if it got into public hearing setting but they still have the option to come before the board and the board can say, no, it is allowed under that complementary clause. The, the applicant has the ability to, uh, the, so the rules and regulations require that the applicant give me their application to review and um, I deem it complete and it moves along in the process. If I were to tell them that, no, I don't think this application should move forward, they have the right under state law to take that application directly to the town clerk and have it certified stamped into the into the town record. And once that's done, the board is obligated uh, to follow procedures for calling the hearing. And so that would be a way that, you know, an applicant could get to the board. And uh, in a case where I came to the board and said why I wasn't supportive of the application and explain why, the board still has the, you know, the decision they they interpret the bylaw in the hearing setting and apply the language how they see fit uh and and can make a decision even if it's not in this you know consistent with what i'm doing thank you so can i just ask a quick question mr henry is that an appeal to the building decision or is that a special permit case so so that that example that that we just went through is not an appeal. That is just you know taking permit. it okay. taking it to the board on their own. Now, if I were to say 
put something in writing to them or even an email that said why I think the application didn't meet the criteria the bylaw and could be authorized, uh, that's a decision that they can appeal to the zoning board as well. So it could come to the board in the form of an appeal, um, but then they'd have to, depending on the answer, then they'd have to go back and start the, the special permit process uh, over. Oftentimes, um, you might see that done concurrently. So there might be an appeal filed with a special permit request and they could file that together. And that way they're right into that special permit hearing if the, uh, if the, if the discussion goes their way. Thank you, Mr. Henry. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's okay. Um, and the other thing I, I heard, um, owner occupied versus non owner occupied. So, Am I, am, am I to understand that the only difference here, I mean, buildings are the same, principal use are the same, it is a dwelling, but one is owner occupied, the other one is not, um, but arguably owned by the same person, that is, you would not permit that? Um, so in the, in the duplex category, um, I don't know, it was maybe 12, 10, 12 years ago, there, there, we just simply had duplex, you know, as the category. And then town meeting decided to separate and, and have non-owner occupied and owner occupied and apply stricter criteria, obviously, to those non-owner occupied properties uh, by requiring resident managers and, and expiration on change of ownership and so on. But by doing the way, the way they created that category, it became its own use classification. It, it, it got its own number in the table. Uh, so that's two different principal uses. And because neither one of those sections uh, of the bylaw authorize more than one building to be on a single property, the interpretation of 3.01 will say that that can't happen. So the what I'm struggling with is two different principal uses. I mean, simplistically, and maybe I'm being too simple. It, it is for me. It is not two different principal uses. Um, and a dwelling is you know a house where someone lives or sleeps or you know it's they're being used in in my simplicity. They're being used for the same thing. The only difference here is that one is being lived in by the owner and the other one is just being rented. The principal use is the same. They're being used for the same principal purpose as a dwelling. That would not be permitted. I know what the answer is. The, so the... I, I think I get to, I, I agree it's not permitted, but the reason for not permitting it, I think is different than yours. Um, so they, because of the way our, our bylaw is designed, each section of article three is a separate use classification. Therefore, any one of those can be a principal use. And when you combine any two of those, even the ones that are very closely related, and I think Hilda mentioned earlier, sorority fratern and fraternity, you know, even though they're really closely related, they may be or may not be two different principal uses. And the two family section, because it's split and non owner occupied and owner occupied, although they look and function very similarly, they are different uses. And that would, that would, um, that would create a multiple principal use of the property if they were to be combined, just like, and no different than if the townhouse and apartment was combined, It'd be two, two principal uses that are combined and, and they're all dwelling units. Can I butt in and just say the reason for that? Yeah. Yes. And yes. it's still going on today. It's this anti-undergraduate tenant issue that, People in neighborhoods really wanted tight control over the behavior of some undergraduate, and I will say they're very few. But, but you know, they tend to have 180 different daily schedules of sleeping and playing than the neighbors next door, and 
the non-owner occupied therefore we put under special permit so that lots of regulations and conditions could be put on the permit where they figure and this may this is a big generalization too the, the people who are putting forward all of the new regulations for tenants um tend to be in these neighborhoods and and I forgot what I was going to say, but but basically there's this anti anti undergraduate guys in this town, and and they and the neighbors want control, and they feel it owner occupied, so living you know the owners are living in the house and they care about their property, and I don't think that's necessarily true when you drive around town, but nevertheless they're allowed to do it by right. That's Thank the you. way things are. I think that's a justification, you know, because I think that's perhaps a justification for why the town, why town meeting that's created two principal uses. That's it. Right. That's it. But, that's but there the are, problem. but the real yes. reason. What? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say the real reason that it is a prince that there are two principal uses is because there's a specific reference in the table. One is 3.3210 and one is 3.3211. And they're two separate principal uses because they're defined as such in the, the bylaw, I think. And well, if we I'm did wrong, that. you know, but I think that's the case. And that's why Mr. Henry's question, I think, is even though it's it seems like the same use, that it's a residential use, but they're a principal use is defined in the in the bylaw, I think. Yeah, I would that's add the impact on the neighborhood that people assume if the owner is there, the kids aren't going to be having a party till midnight, you know. Well, yeah, I think that's... I mean, that that's the impact, basically, needs to be, um, um, net, you know, ameliorated on the neighborhood. And and so they, they, they are regulated and the owner occupies are allowed by right. That's basically it. Mr. Henry, did you want to, did you have other questions you wanted to ask? I, I, I did have one more question, but uh, Ms. Marshall did for a while, so I'll let her go and see if my question comes back to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Ms. I want to, Rob, I want to make sure I under, understand an example you gave to um, Craig, where you imagined a single family house becoming a converted dwelling in two units. And that would take a special permit. And then you said maybe they have have an outbuilding. And I think you said they want to convert it to a dwelling. I, I assume that would have to be an accessory dwelling. Otherwise, your interpretation would not allow multiple dwellings. Yes? No. Um, so I was my example was um, one that would be using the converted dwelling classification section of the bylaw. <clears throat> so not single family, not duplex at all. So everything would be permitted under converted dwelling and converted dwellings are, are permitted either within uh, 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 existing single family structure being converted into additional units or a detached accessory structure such as a barn or a garage of a certain age being turned into a unit. So the bylaw has um, two different paths for converted dwelling, two different opportunities, either in the principal structure or in the accessory structure. And because we specifically allow both to occur, that could all be done as converted dwelling. As one property, the property has a converted dwelling use and might have two units in one building and one unit in a, in a, old, in a barn that's been converted. So it's using that specific category. That, that sounds like a loophole. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't, not, not, you couldn't build a really. duplex and then build a single, a small single family home next to it. You, right? You said those that would be disallowed because it's two dwellings. Right. So the converted, the intent of the converted dwelling section is to use existing housing, how, existing structures and repurpose them or improve them and with very, very little alteration. Uh, so it's, it's, I think it's quite different than a brand new building okay. and then another brand new building. 
uh, subsequent to that. So um, it really is using a, a, a bylaw provision that was intentional to take larger homes, break them up, or uh, older barns and save them. Okay, but a, okay. I won't get into AD. <laughs> Thank you. But that is a way to add another small dwelling, yes? It, ADUs are only allowed on owner-occupied properties that have only a single-family dwelling. Okay. That's the only, that's the limit on ADUs. It can't be an ADU on a property with a duplex or a property that is an owner-occupied. Right, and it has to be small; otherwise, it would be considered a second single-family home. Yes. Okay. That was the. I think that's right. the rationale for the the lower uh, square footage for the right. ADU. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I was in and, town meeting. Oh, I was in town meeting when it, when that was passed, and uh, the planning board brought it up as a mother-in-law apartment. And so, if, I mean, I have a separate garage from my house. It's not attached at all, and that could be converted. But um, and th that was the rationale. So, so maybe when I get a little infirm, I might do that. We'll see. More, Mr. White, you haven't uh, asked a question yet. Put your hand up. Yeah, just real quick, um, Mr. Henry, and please, Mr. Mora, correct me. I'm probably wrong, um, but Mr. Henry, my interpretation of that as to why kind of they were looking at different things goes to intent, um, because my interpretation, if you're talking about owner occupied, the intent of that is to provide residence for the property owner, whereas the secondary residence is it's in its purpose is to generate revenue for said owner yes it's still a residence but its purpose is to generate revenue otherwise it wouldn't be there filed as that is that correct at all mr mar um i mean it could be behind you know why they might have separated them or or supporting that um, but in an owner occupied duplex, I mean, the other, the other unit is generating revenue yeah. intentionally. I mean, that is the intent of, of, of the duplex. I think the, the, um, uh, it's, it's offering an opportunity to, to, um, you know, live, live in an area and afford a property that maybe you wouldn't otherwise have been able to. And I think there's a lot of that discussion going on now with, uh, in, in the recent months on how to even, allow have the bylaw allow even more of that so um i don't know I, I guess i wasn't part of those discussions enough to be able to say one way or the other for sure let me just if i may just end this um that assumes that every non-owner occupied dwelling is for financial purposes i mean what if there's an elderly couple who realize that at the end of their days, they do not want to be in a hospice or nursing facility, and they have children who will live close by, and they're like, you know what, I can build this secondary unit on here. I'm the, you know, that there's no financial gain. It's just that it's a family property that's been used. So with that, there's no financial gain. And that's, I'm just going to leave my point right there. Yeah. Well, there's no financial gain for a while until the building is sold or the unit becomes available to for rental, right? Then it could be for, but there's no financial gain initially, right? No. There could be financial gain later on. But I don't think that's the, yeah, I, I see what you're, I see your point, Mr. Henry, yeah. But you had other questions. I think you wanted to. That you, you I think I heard. I um, I think I heard something um, about a car wash and a daycare. I didn't quite. I, I wrote some notes, but I'm um, that a permit wouldn't be granted if you know a, a daycare wants to be built in the same area as a car wash. Can Can you help me understand that part? Because I'm sure. thinking out loud, and I know a daycare across the street from a gas station. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Right now. <laughs> um, 
yeah, may, maybe bad examples, but um, that, this is back to section 3.01. So if we take dwelling unit out of the equation, and you know we're, we're not looking at that language that says not more than one dwelling, and we kind of skip over to say, uh, or not more than one principal use, unless the principal uses are found to be complementary. That's that's where this example is relevant. And uh, this is typically, um, I think, more often been dealt with by the planning board. But my example was uh, of multiple principal uses on a property that we have today are, say, a gas station and a car wash. Something you typically see together. Um, they can found they can probably pretty easily be found to be complementary, and and where I was trying to go in an alternative thinking is well, what would it be like to have um, a daycare on a property with say you know a, an auto body repair shop or something you know something kind of completely unrelated? Could that be something that the board uh, would have difficulty finding? to be complementary, again, on the same parcel. So not across the street from each other, not in a zoning district that allows all these different types of uses, but on the same parcel. Interaction you know, with people coming and going into the establishments, parking and so on. Um, that's where, and, and I kind of preface that with, there's not a really good, there's not good guidance on this. And it would be something that the board would have to think carefully about and work through and make that decision because we don't define complementary uh, how things can be compatible or should be compatible uh, and that's really left up to, to the board's discretion um, so when you think of the larger um, retail or commercial uh, developments like out on university drive you know you have medical office um, uh, banking uh, liquor sales and a restaurant you know they're all separate uses that are permitted and, and found to be complementary with each other at some point in time by whatever board was, was permitting that. And when the next one comes, that same question comes up. Is it complementary to the, to the other uses that are on the property? Uh, and like that's it, there's, there's really no other guidance in the bylaw for that. So just thinking about the people prior to us who probably approved these, I, I would agree with them in the sense that complementary that they're all commercial business. Um, you know, people, it's it's very convenient for people. I mean, okay, you go to the bank, you go to the, your grocery store. They're all right here. It's a you know, it's complementary. Um, let me ask this um, hypothetical um, with complementary because what about um, say? For like a, a, a strip mall, um, where it's a it's a singular building. However, um, you can have four or five different businesses in the same building, and they're completely different from each other. For example, um, let's stay with the whole daycare, daycare and a dojo, or and then next to it is a restaurant. Um, or wouldn't those be complementary to each other? Because again, they fall into the whole realm of commercial business. Sure, I would think so. But you know, what if it's some kind of manufacturing or something that creates loud noise yeah. or fumes or a lot of um, deliveries coming and going of large tractor trailers delivering products? You know, that I think your examples are easier. And those are the ones I was looking for, the easy ones to try to demonstrate what a complementary use could be. But then there are the ones that maybe aren't so clear as that. And maybe there is a detriment to having the two uses together. Could be safety related. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think we have an example that we've done in town where we've said no, they're not complementary. Um, I just don't think we've been uh, you know, presented with that. But it, it all comes if we are presented with a questionable a question about whether an activity is complementary or not, it's up to us because it's not defined. And we have to use our best judgment as board as to whether it is, it is not complementary because of the danger to the daycare center for the fumes from the auto, to the manufacturing plant next door or the traffic that um, is part of the, the fumes from the tractor trailer truck that's parked eight hours a, a day in front of the, behind the, the daycare center. So that really comes to us, right, to make that decision and that's our our discretion in that regard. 
It, it is. And, you know, and to keep in mind that this is this is just another level, uh, another finding, another piece of the criteria that gets reviewed in the decision the board makes. You still go through your special permit 10.38 findings and, and the, the proposal itself might have difficulty, uh, you know, passing for those reasons. Um, so it's just another layer. It's kind of like 9.22 when you're dealing with nonconformities. You got that second second mm -hmm. consideration after you've gone through all the 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 um, the impacts of the use. So, so Mr. Moore, I, I am with you with quite frankly, but ninety five percent of everything that you said with the whole complimentary. But I'm still struggling where with all these examples with why a second dwelling. Um, would not be complimentary. Um, I, I, I get the whole, um, you know, I, I hear all the examples, I appreciate the examples, I understand them, but I'm still struggling where that project that was canceled would not have been complimentary. I'm still struggling with that part. Yeah, um, so so back to 3.01, um, it's, it's really given meaning to the, to the portion of that section that says not more than one dwelling. Not more than one dwelling shall be permitted on a parcel is what it's saying. Unless, uh, and then it goes on to the principal uses, um, the multiple principal uses, but not more than one dwelling. So if we give the the most amount of meaning to that, that, that clause, we're saying that dwelling units, they can't be on, they can't be combined on the same property unless the bylaw otherwise in other locations say whether or not they're principal uses. So uh, same principle uses. So essentially what I'm saying for residential dwellings, we have to first determine that the bylaw allows the different dwellings to exist, the different buildings and, and classifications to exist. And then we find that they're complementary. So in one and two family, our bylaw doesn't allow more than one building. For townhouses and apartments, the bylaw does. For converted dwelling, the bylaw does allow more than one building. So when you're faced with an application that includes townhouses with apartment buildings or townhouses or, or let's say apartment buildings with mixed use buildings, the board reviewing that application will be able to see that the bylaw authorizes it and on top of that, you have to make the, the finding that they're complementary. And you should be able to, right? I mean, I think I agree with you that any res combination of residential uses seemingly could be complementary to each other. Um, there has to be something pretty interesting about it for, to say no uh, to that. But we're stuck with, you know, giving meaning to this bylaw. And if we're gonna say not that we can't have two single family property buildings and we can't have two duplexes, you know, that's the way we got to read this bylaw and be consistent with it applying to all of the residential uses that do not authorize more than one building. That where principal uses are clearly complementary to each other. Right. I think Ms. Greenbaum has her hand up, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Ms. Greenbaum. Yeah, I just wanted to say that when Mill Valley Estates was put in 40 years ago, they did have a daycare center as part of their 40B application. I don't know whether it's still running or not, but nowadays the trend has been for lots of corporations to provide child care and people work from home part time and other kinds of various things because that's the only way they can hire people is if somebody's taking care of their kids. Um, and so that's clearly two principal uses. And, and I, I sort of, you, you can get torn with some of these home office things. Like my father was a doctor with an office in the house in the olden days. Um, you could do that either as two principal, I don't know, it's a home office, it's in the same building, but the point is, it's a pretty heavy use when they got patients coming in there all afternoon and all evening in the neighborhood. Um, some home offices are people who just code computer programs all day long and nobody ever comes in and out, which is sort of the difference of the doctor's office being two principal uses 
in one building, which the, the person who sits home and codes all day or, or works on this computer all day long is more like an accessory use because there's zero impact on the neighborhood. So that's sort of the difference between the two. The whole issue of 3.01 is these neighborhoods that are feeling overwhelmed, I think, and they want to be protected from what they would not, con not consider particularly enlightened uses next door. So that's the issue we're debating now with 798. And if, you know, if it was two families or 40B, you couldn't say anything about it. But if it, if it was going to be two families living next door, probably in attached houses, you wouldn't be getting a neighborhood uproar over it. You probably nobody would come in and complain. But because of the history of that property, it's, it's hitting the water neighborhoods. And that's what we sort of run into, how, how to be fair to everybody because not everybody is like those landlords. And they're, Rob, you know, there's probably 5% of landlords in this town that are problematic. Yet we're all, ultimately tenants are all gonna have to pay for this stuff, whether it's zoning or whether it's, you know, regular bylaws. Landlords aren't gonna eat it and they'll just push the rents up. But they don't get it, um, you know. I got tenants on all sides of me. I'm the only. Well, I got one <laughs> owner occupied. I haven't seen in twenty years. But I got tenants on all sides of me that belong to Bruce Patterson. I don't even know who they are, and they've been there for. One came over when my husband died, and she said, "I've been in April for eighteen years." You know, I don't know they're there. That's that's behind people are very unhappy about other things too. It's global, but just one of many concerns people have, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Eating tomorrow should be the one they only worry about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm this is representative of the, I think, the intricacies and sometimes the Byzantine nature of the zoning bylaw. You get you get into it, you think you understand it, and then somebody who really spends their time working on it a lot, Rob or Rob, um, can point you to something that, that just opens up a new avenue that you didn't think about. And I find that that's the case a lot with what is is um, really a complicated intertwined set of restrictions and permissions in the bylaw. And that's why it makes, it's really helpful, Rob and Rob, to have you guys help us guide through it. And also to remember that a lot of this reason that it's complicated is that we have discretion. We have a lot of discretion as a board to allow these things if we can make the findings required to exercise that discretion. We have to make the, find, the, the, the bylaw sets out certain findings we have to make and if in our judgment we can make those findings based on the conditions that we add or upon the, the application itself, we have a lot of discretion um, to decide whether to allow the, the application to go forward or not. And that's kind of where, why it's important that we spend the time doing exactly what we're doing tonight to try to understand it better. So um, I guess I, that's a, a preaching that you didn't need to hear because you're all here to do this. So I appreciate it. but. Um, Maybe there's other questions that people have about the bylaw or about the ZBA process, what we do, or anything else that's related, even tangentially, tangentially to uh, the ZBA. And I, this is a good opportunity to ask those questions or raise concerns. I just, want to add, I just want to add something to what you said. Um, I, I, I absolutely agree with you that um, we're we're lucky to have the two Robs um, <laughs> um, with us because yes, it, it does add perspective to hear um, their their positions into why. But when I when I read this, and um, I, I I don't think we should shy away from deciding, making our own best judgment. Um, because the applicants that come before us, um, they want a decision as well. And we should 
you know, with their guidance, hear their position, um, make her best interpretation of the bylaws. And I think about it the way I go before a judge. Um, the prosecutor make an argument, I make an argument, the judge reads the law, and sometimes it is not very clear as to what it says, and that's what they do. They make their best judgment. Sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. And but I think we have an obligation to you know to say yes or no um, without saying we need more guidance because things are unclear. If Mr. Moore thinks this is not allowed and the applicant says, I think we need a second opinion, we are that second opinion. And um, again, we may not get it perfect, but here in everyone's position into Ms. Greenbaum's point, you know, uh, a, a lot of this is um, about his concerns and those are valid concerns, but the people that come before us, they're also taxpayers. Um, you know, they, they, they are also members of our community. So we have to, you know, make a decision also for them as well. So I'm not saying we're going to say yes all the time um, or no all the time, but we should make it, they should be heard and we should make a decision um, for them, whether it is a yes or a no. Mr. Mora. Yeah, I, I just want to say, I mean, I that agree 100% with that. And just to um, state that that situation is is so rare that I don't even know if it's ever happened before. I you know it's it's very unusual that um, staff would be going to the board to tell them you can't you can't process this application. You know that's not what we do. We typically don't even take a, you know that kind of a position. We just uh, present the information and let you make the call. Um, but what was very clear about that particular case and usually is when things aren't going well is that applicant wanted, didn't want your decision. They didn't want to know what the answer was. They still don't want to know what the answer is. I know this. Uh, so, you know, the, and, and we've seen this too many times when things are not going smoothly, the applicants ask to get out of the process uh, and, and, you know, think about where they want to go next. And, and, you know, I, I'm sure in other communities and maybe with your, your, you know, your experience, there are applicants looking for the answer, but that's typically not what we're dealing with with these one and two family properties, uh, like you would be with a larger development uh, or a larger developer. Um, so uh, I knew that 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 applicant wanted uh, wanted to end the session as soon as possible. Um, just Rob, just a second. Greenbaum has her hand up. No, I just wanted to say I those guys spent a lot of money on that project. A lot of I can tell you that Coon Riddle is not cheap and Berkshire is not cheap. And and I would bet that they put well into five figures, at least twenty, twenty-five thousand of each for something that wasn't viable. And I I don't understand why they continued with it. You know, why wouldn't Coon Riddle or somebody tell what well, they like the money too? I guess it's all a question of who's stuffing whose pocket. But they invested a lot of money in something that can happen. And they, I don't know, how does something like that happen? How does it get that? Are they from Boston and they just don't know how things work here in the, in the birds? You know, I don't. So, so it happens, it, it does happen. Um, we actually have other applications that were some of the applicants we've talked to about this already and some haven't even heard, you know, what the interpretation of the bylaw is. Um, sometimes, you know, when you get a confident developer or investor, they're right into design, they're right into, you know, survey work and, you know, that's when we get it, you know, it's not, we see applications at all different levels from sometimes just from the, the idea to talk it through to, you know, a set of plans rolled out in front of us for the first time in, in town hall. Uh, so we have other, other proposals that, you know, don't work. I mean, there's a, a pretty uh, active 
uh, case that's been uh, in the public on Fearing Street, where in the that's gone through the local historic district review, at least initially, you know, where they proposed, I think it was three duplexes on a property with an apartment building. You know, that hasn't even come to the to the zoning uh, office yet uh, with an application. So, you know, we we had to tell them, you know, that's not going to work you know, and, and, you know, but, rethink but, your design, you know, so, but the baseline information is still good. Survey is still good, you know, for the property. And they'll use that to, you know, work out maybe a different footprint for an apartment building or some other, some other idea to, uh, to add development on the property. I have to tell you something funny. When I, back in, in 84, five, when I was, was, watching zoning and planning for the League of Women Voters, I discovered I had three quarters of an acre on North Whitney Street that was on RG. I says, gee, the only things I'm finding there at the end of the weekend are things I don't want to see, which you don't have that issue anymore, but you did then. And so I go, I talk to Chad, he says, oh, draw me a picture. <laughs> And it ended up I had a higher architect in the end anyway, but he just says to me, draw a picture. Very different. Yeah, different time. Other issues, questions, comments, concerns? Anything from Rob? Yes, you had your hand up. I'm sorry. So to add on to what the other Rob said earlier about us providing you guys um, expertise and advice and interpretation of the bylaw you know those project application reports they're more like obviously you know they're cheat sheets like they really help you learn a lot about the different permits and the different properties and the different types of use and stuff but you know i always come across a lot of times when you know there's interpretation in the bylaw itself within each of the sections where it could be interpreted any way that the board sees fit and it's very important that you know we usually make those aware to, to all of you that you do have authority to make interpretations certain ways throughout the bylaw as it pertains to a certain permit. But there's other times where, you know, we see something that comes before staff and we're unsure whether or not, you know, the board would interpret it a certain way. So those are sometimes questions that are really hard to answer. And it's entirely up to you guys because essentially, you know, being a quasi judicial body, you have the ability to interpret the bylaw within the provisions of the bylaw, however you see fit. Um, Rob basically just, you know, he interprets the bylaw from the perspective as the zoning enforcement officer. So, you know, in terms of co-compliance or interpreting the bylaw when we receive an application, those are kind of important areas to consider too. So I, I kind of wanted to, to, to add that on to what you said earlier, Rob, but, you know, Hilda asked a really good question in between. So my apologies for the raise my hand late. Are we changing anything? Are we just understanding each other better? Hilda, I couldn't understand you. Can you say that again? I said, after this discussion, are we changing any policies or are we just understanding what's happening better? I don't see any policies to change. Um, yeah, no, so we, can't, it, we can't change the zoning stuff. We could. And we haven't noticed any um, proposed policies in the, in our bylaws that our rules and regs to change. Well, three right. So this was just the, the 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 purpose of this discussion was just to let you know how I'll interpret the bylaw and inform applicants of what what the bylaw says or how I would deal with an enforcement of the bylaw if I needed to. Um, you know, it, we're we're gonna try hard to never have what happened. Uh, with that case on North Pleasant Street where I wasn't ready to, I hadn't looked at it enough to even be able to give you the answer at the time. So, um, you know, it made sense to get out of that, that meeting since everybody wanted to get out of that meeting because there wasn't any other guidance to give. I, you know, I, I couldn't share my interpretation because I didn't know what it was going to be yet. Um, so that should never happen. It hasn't happened before. And I'm hoping that doesn't happen again. Because, um, that we're not prepared for the meeting. Uh, if a question like that comes up, uh, we should we should not find ourselves in that situation again. Great. 
Well, if there are no other questions, I did want to go on to the um, uh, schedule for the 40B. And Rob, you, you sent around um, a, a schedule for and with topics um, in the meeting packets. And I think in our last or a meeting a week ago, we set up, we asked staff to, to set up the, um, the meeting schedule for us. And I looked this over, this seems to make sense. The only thing that um, I'm wor I worry about, Rob, is if the, all the, if the work that the CONCOM has to do and what they're, what they're being, what the applicant is being asked to do for the CONCOM and then the peer review the CONCOM may have, if that will be done in time for us to to take up that matter on December seventh, and we for us to decide, we need to have a, a peer review as well, and will we be able to get it done before, with Christmas and everything coming up by January? So I don't, it's I just don't don't know about the the stormwater management schedule on December seventh, and maybe you could talk that through. Yeah, sure. I mean. We kind of initially uh, developed this schedule because of, you know, what was discussed at that last meeting. Um, yeah. In terms of CONCOM's review, I mean, I haven't heard anything from Aaron Jack, our um, wetlands administrator, as to whether or not there's any significant issues that might even need peer review. Um, mm -hmm. And Rob, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, but they have to go back to CONCOM, right? They do well, have I think to go back to Concom. I think they're doing Concom at the same time, so they're doing both permits uh, simultaneously. Um, right. Rob, do you do you know more about the permitting process side of this through Concom um, for this project? I know they, I don't think they're encroaching any wetlands, um, and I fully. I mean, the December seventh date was picked because of the fact that it's after that initial Concom hearing, and. You know, this schedule also isn't finalized. If we need to make changes to it, we definitely could. Yeah. Um, I think the most important thing is the fact that the first two hearings deal with the plans. So, for example, the site plan and the architecture. Um, and one more note to add. So for that November 2nd meeting for the site um, plans themselves, we're going to have a site visit earlier that week. So next week, um, if the applicant's able to before the meeting, because... Um, we want the board to have a good visualization of what the layout is going to look like, you know, before they have that um, hearing date. Um, so I noticed there's two hands, Mr. Chair. I don't know if they, yeah. if you want them to ask their questions. Yep. Mr. Meadows. Um, you might notice that I'm in a hotel room uh, and I'm here in Orlando to learn more about um the new tax structures for mechanical systems. Um, and we don't have that indicated, we don't have mechanicals indicated anywhere in the, um, in the schedule and that may take up some time. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't feel like it's my, uh, my position to go to them directly and make suggestions based upon uh, tax credits and et cetera. But, uh, but there, uh, I've got some projects and we're, we're making a, a complete turn because of the fact that the tax credits are so meaningful that we're, we're putting in different types of systems than we would have originally. And it may have bearing on what they're doing. I don't know. Maybe they're, they're on top of it, but there's a good possibility they're not. Um, and so uh, it would, I think it would be worthwhile to include a discussion of the mechanical systems somewhere in there mm -hmm. and the discussion of the tax credits available to them as a result of it. So would it be wise to include that on that November 30th date in addition yeah. to architecture? Uh, it, it, either the second or the, or the 30th. I would think that, uh, that the 30th is probably more logical because it would fit in with the architecture and, and maybe yeah. they could they could have their mechanical engineers in there too or someone who understands the tax credits just to clarify you're referring to home heating and cooling systems correct for tax credits okay yeah so i make sure all right yeah i mean that makes that fits in because they incorporate a lot of stuff into the building design too 
as well. So that I think logically speaking, Mr. Chair, um, it would make sense yeah, to add that to November 30th as well. And I'll definitely make that separate bullet point so they're aware that they have to bring their architects in to discuss that too. And, and of course you, we can, sorry. As you know, I'm not going to be here on January 4th. So in that situation, Mr. Chair, I think, so Craig did mention to me previously that he will be unavailable for January 4th. So the only thing about that, Craig, is that we'll have to talk to the applicant and get them to agree to instead of doing the January 4th to do the week after that, or I think I'm the third, sorry. I'm gone from January 20, mm -hmm. from December 27th to January 14th. 14th. I'm, um, I'm, I'm, okay. Yeah. Let me see. We can discuss this offline too, Craig. Um, and we, we can discuss that during the next meeting for this, just so we can, you know, make sure we're on the same page, but um, thank you for making me aware of that. And, you know, we'll try to accommodate your schedule accordingly to, to make sure you're on that panel. So when, because that last meeting is going to be important for, for voting on the permit itself. Um, so yeah, I didn't mean to go off topic there, but. Um, we'll have to figure that out. I think there'll be a lot of, we'll have to do this offline. I think. You know, otherwise yeah, I, I agree with that. Let's the question I have, some, I have some trouble too in January. So, Rob, we're, we've got some challenges trying to figure out the last meeting. Okay. Yeah, we can discuss that at a later time. But um, I think two other people have questions, Mr. Chair. Yep. I, mine's very quick. Do we, do we yep. need a unanimous vote for this? No, no, three votes. Okay. A comprehensive permit only requires a, a simple majority of the board as opposed to the four vote majority we need for special permits. Okay. Mr. Chair, I know you can't see Ms. Marshall's hand, but she's had up for a while. Um, I don't know if you want to call her next. All right. You know, it, it fades in, your, your, your hand fades into your background. Oh, I changed the color. I'm trying to make it visible. Um, I'm, not, I'm not on the 40B panels. I don't have the agenda in front of me. Am I needed anymore this evening? Uh, that is entirely up to you. No, okay. we have no other issue that, unless you want to raise one, we have no other issue than this. No. Okay. Then I'll say good night. All right. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Uh, Mr. Chair, so I guess um, in terms of this schedule, just so we're on the same page, January 4th, that date might change. We could discuss that at the next meeting. Um, yeah. And then November 30th, I'm going to include a separate bullet point for mechanical systems. And then mechanical systems and tax incentives, Craig, could be combined into the same topic. Right. Um, yeah. And then we can make the applicant aware of those opportunities um, in the public you know, hearing format. But other than that, I mean, does the schedule seem okay to the board, you know, pending those changes that we just discussed? Definitely. We may have to extend out the, Jan the last hearing beyond January 4th, and we'll have to talk to the applicant about that. But I'm just uh, wondering. If we need more time for local preference, because it was sounding from what she was said last week, that's not going to be an easy thing. I, well, I think, yeah, was, you're, I didn't understand her answer so much where she said, I don't recommend that you apply for local preference. And I want to talk about that. Okay. Because I, I don't understand what she meant. Well, I think that that December 21st meeting does have a lot of um, a lot of topics in it, but we've gone through some of it already. And but mm -hmm. local preference will always take a lot of time, Ms. Green. But yeah. I, I, if we need it to have more time, it, we'll take it. I can't understand what you said. It, it was. I said lo local preference always take. I think it's a very controversial and issue that will take a lot of time. And if we don't have enough time in December 21st to do it, we'll have to extend into uh, a later hearing if we need to. Thank you, I'm glad to hear that because I wasn't happy with the answer, if I understood it correctly. Yep. Mr. White. Um, <clears throat> I think everything looks fine. The only thing that I would ask that we have a discussion about at some meeting, I don't actually have a preference where it goes, but, uh, it was mentioned that there's a possibility of a wildlife corridor being disrupted. Oh, yeah. Um, so I would like mm -hmm. to hear something about that at some point. Um, but other than that, no, let's. 
I forgot about that. Yes, we want to see. We want to see that. Maybe, maybe you can get the homeowner a butter to show us where it is when we have the site visit. Okay. And wouldn't, um, it, wouldn't it not be logically in the November second meeting with site design and landscaping? We could ask the applicant because um, we don't know if they did the work for that, and if they were to create a presentation to discuss that wildlife corridor they're probably going to want an expert or somebody on the engineering firm's team to be present to discuss that and i think you know give them only one week to prepare for that might be a little bit too soon so i think it might be wise um to maybe push that off to december 7th meeting to discuss that as a topic but i mean we i could reach out to the applicant tomorrow and see if that's possible and we can tie that into the november 2nd discussion but I just want to make the board aware that could be a real possibility on their end. Okay. All right. I appreciate it, Rob. Yeah. And I will, I'll definitely um, take note of that too. And I'll let everybody know. And as the schedule changes, I'll definitely keep everybody in the loop and send it out to all of you. So you're not left out and forget a meeting or two. All right. There are no other questions. Um, I think we've dealt with the um, the old business and, and kind of our administrative business. The last thing we've got is a public comment. So this is an option. Every public meeting, uh, we set aside time for public comments where they can comment on anything that's, except those matters before the board tonight. I think we've driven everybody away. Uh, there's only there's nobody left attending other than us. So. Um, we open it up, but we're opening it up to nobody. So there's no public comment likely to occur. Mr. Chair, um, the um the only person who was in attendance was Chris Bresh of the plan director. I saw that. <laughs> she, yeah. I checked earlier. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was it. Um, but there must be something else going on in town tonight. I can't understand why people aren't throttling <laughs> to watch us. Anyway. Um, with that, I would entertain a motion for adjournment. Do I have one? So moved. I we got, and I'm assuming there's a second as well. Yes, a second. Okay, <laughs> we have it's been moved and seconded that we adjourn. This motion is not debatable. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows, aye. Mr. White, aye. Mr. Henry, aye. Ms. Greenbaum. Aye. Motion is unanimous. I, I don't know if you heard anything. Yep, I heard you. Yeah, the vote is uh, five to nothing, and we are adjourned. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye.